Um, we call it on the ACUPAC. And what that is, that was the Chancellor signed that in 2007, and it has two major components to it. And those two components are, the first is that we will significantly reduce our carbon emissions, our greenhouse gases, with an eventual date of being carbon neutral. And then the second one is that we will educate all of our students about sustainability, and what I call climate disruption. Sometimes it's called climate change, but I think sometimes that's kind of too narrow of a term. It really is about disruption and how we're going to deal with it, which you're going to hear a lot about tonight. So one of the other things that we've been doing to support that second goal is that we've recently gone through a two-year process, it'll be three when we finish, of redoing our general education goals. And now sustainability is actually a part of those general education goals. So we are looking to infuse sustainability and climate into the curriculum so that all students actually have that um, that touch with, the, with those subjects. So that's part of the reason that we're doing this three-day with Dr. Hackman, and that's why we supported a faculty workshop yesterday with 20 faculty members that came to learn about how can we better incorporate this into our classrooms. All but right. I, yeah. <laughs> I want to thank you in a minute, too, because you were part of the person who provided that. Um, and that's chemistry teachers or women's and ethnic study teachers. It doesn't really matter what faculty you are. Uh, the message here is that it can, be, it can be in every different type of class and different curriculum. So I do have a couple of thank yous. This, this program came to um, fruition and bringing Dr. Hackman here from a lot of different departments on campus. And those are uh, the matrix, anthropology, sociology, women's and ethnic studies, Students for Environmental Awareness and Sustainability, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, Geography and Environmental Studies, the Provost, and the Office of Sustainability. So a lot of collaboration on this. It's great. So I want to give a little background for Dr. Hackman so you know kind of who's going to be presenting to you. Dr. Hackman has been teaching and training on social justice issues since 1992 and was a tenured professor in the Department of Human Relations and Multicultural Education at St. Cloud State University in St. Cloud, Minnesota for 12 years before she began fo focusing full-time on consulting. She's taught courses in social justice and multicultural education, pre-service and in-service teachers, race and racism, heterosexism and homophobia, social justice education, higher education leadership, oppression and social change, sexism and gender oppression, class oppression, and Jewish oppression. Jewish oppression. She received her doctorate in social justice education from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. In 2005, she founded Hackman Consulting Group and consults nationally on issues of deep diversity, equity, and social justice, and has focused most of her recent training work on issues of racism and white privilege, gender oppression, heterosexism and homophobia, phobia and classism. She has published in the area of social justice education theory and practice, racism and healthcare, and is currently working on two books, one examining issues of race, racism, and whiteness in education through a model she calls cellular wisdom, and another addressing anti-racism professional development training for E through 12 professionals. In 2009, she was awarded a research fellowship with the Great Place to Work Institute and has developed corporate training rubrics that combine her social justice content with GPWI's trust frameworks. Her most recent research and conference presentations are focused on climate change and, in inter and its intersections with issues of race, class, and gender. Please help me welcome Dr. Heather Hackett. Can you hear me in the back? Awesome. Oh, that's just a profoundly boring bio. <laughs> I, mean, I hear it. I hear it quite often. I'm like, what a snooze fest. I need to write it differently. Like, she's small but mighty. You know, like start with that. Yeah, do something like that. That'd be yeah, right. I see. So, and I should change the title to climate disruption um, because that's a really that's a that's an outstanding point. And that what's happening is not just some kind of tepid change or even some evolutionary movement, that it's really an intense and jarring disruption that we're experiencing. And so right on for that. Thanks for that point. And just to show of hands, how many people are students in the room? <gasps> I love you. Oh. 
Oh, it's been a year and a half since I've been in the classroom, and there's a whole pile of stuff about being a faculty member I don't miss for a second. It's not even, I didn't even miss it when I was doing it. You know, I'm like, oh, this is horrible. But being with students is just so fantastic. It's just so fantastic. And you just rock the world. You're just amazing. So I'm just, I'm so delighted that you're here. I can hardly, oh, I can hardly stand it. Okay, so, and I not, I grew up in Las Vegas, but I have lived in Minnesota for 12 years, so I have a bit of a Minnesota accent. So I'll go, hey, soul, occasionally. And it'll just, it's an awesome transition point. Like, okay now. And then you'll know, like, we're moving on to another slide. So feel free to hop up, nosh as you will, nosh as you will, because we need to take care of our bodies and buckle up because I have piled up just a ton of information as all teachers tend to do we put too much into a, a, an action-packed a time period and my feeling is what up you know we're gonna we'll get to it if we can get to it and we'll do the best that we can but I'd rather over prepare than have four slides and say thanks for coming and so we're gonna really go for it we're gonna really go for it so the first thing we're gonna do is just quickly turn to your neighbor um, introduce yourself and say a few words about why you came here. Oh, come on back. So let me just give you a little bit uh, of information about what's brought me to this work, and I, and certainly I want to express my gratitude for the folks who brought me to campus. It's, I love this place. I love looking out. There's a mountain. It's so terrific. We don't really have mountains in Minnesota. We have like whoa, like a hill or just a little rise. But oh, that's delicious. It's a delicious thing to look at. And so I'm grateful to be here, and I'm grateful to be here because this topic means so much to me. Wow, it just means so much to me, and it means so much to me because. Uh, there's a profound urgency around this. There's a profound urgency around this. And I, most of my work is around race, racism and whiteness. I go into multiple settings, for-profits, non-profits, um, higher ed, P12 settings, all kinds of places. I have lots of work in government sectors. I work with doctors and nurses around race, racism and whiteness and racial health care disparities. I do trainings for lawyers and law firms around race, racism and whiteness. It's the bulk of what I do. Um, and one of the things I say is, uh, I used to say in class, is I said, you know, I'll be doing that work until the end of my days. Like that will be, as a white person, I will be doing racial justice work to the very end of my days. Uh, and then my tombstone when I pass or whatever little marker thing, it'll say, here's Heather, she's dead, but she gave it a shot. And maybe a picture of me going, eh, you know, like, eh, that's right. And then it occurred to me, like, wait a minute, if they, if they could read that, they could read articles that are in a little container there. So, <laughs> so it's going to be in my will. Like somebody needs to replenish knapsack articles. There's some kind of white privilege business going on down there. And then students said, well, by the time you kick it, holograms will be common. And so someone, like motion sensor, and someone will walk by, and you can just go, how about a workshop? You know, like, that's so fantastic. And so what I know is I will be doing racial justice work for the to the end of my days, and I will be doing climate justice work till the end of my days. And those two things are not mutually exclusive. They're not even different topics, frankly. They're not even different topics. They're just a different way in to the exact same topic, which is a really unsustainable situation that will utterly destroy society. Race, racism, and whiteness are fundamentally unsustainable social structures. And they will destroy the United States, for sure. They will take us under in the riptide of just the intensity of the violence and the marginalization and the ways that racism operates in this society, and we will all go down. And in a, in a slightly larger, more global scale, if we don't deal with climate change and climate justice and climate disruption, if we don't attend to that in thoughtful, intense, critical, and timely ways, we will all go down. We will all go down. And so, I don't see the difference between those things. I mean, I understand there are vast bodies of literature that inform each. I understand it's a different vernacular for each field. I get that. But at the heart of it, at the heart of why do we do justice work? Why do we care so much? Why do we wake up in the morning and say, today I'm going to try it again? Why do I sit in my vehicle or, or on my bike or in my house or wherever I am and I rehearse ways to respond to people? Like, why do I do that? I have to admit a piece of it probably is ego because I want to be right. So I'll just be honest about that. But most of it is I care so much about this that I want to find the most effective way to help people understand that this is life or death. This is some serious business we got going on here. 
And so what's brought me to this work in teacher ed, the last five, six years of my teacher ed uh, working with future teachers, was to really pull climate change and climate justice content into that class so that no matter what they were teaching in their E12 experience, they would work climate change into that second grade curriculum because they had to. You have to. You have to. So I kind of came into this uh, through my own research and my own study and my own sense of urgency. But I'm a science geek at heart. I was a molecular biology major in my undergrad. I went to Occidental College in Los Angeles. I was pre-med. I was going to be a cardiologist. And then I took a series of left turns, obviously, because I'm not an MD, right? But I play one on television. You know, like, I love the idea of being an MD, but I'm not. I'm not. And yet, I love the, the, um, the ways that science speaks to so many aspects of our humanity. You know, the best place to disprove that race is real is in the biology classroom. It's not in the sociology classroom, actually, no offense, but it's in the science classroom. Because when you biologically disprove the reality of race, any thinking student, and you're all thinking students, would say, so why do we have it? And it's like, brilliant. You are a genius. Why do we have this thing? If it's not even real, what is it doing here? What it's doing here is organizing power. And so, and so there is ways that the poetics of science and you know, the harmonies of social justice content really weave together beautifully. And that's what I'm doing here today. That's what I'm doing here today. And so we're going to be talking about, can you all see that on that side? OK. Hopefully, can you see over me? That's a joke. I know. You, and most people can. And so it's about climate, climate change, climate mind, kind of changing our mind and looking at the climate mindset. And so we'll cut to the chase, that the clock is actually ticking. The days of kind of wondering what we might do, or could we do something, or just emphasizing recycling or something like those days are long gone. The clock is actually ticking on this issue. And so we need an urgency around it. But that urgency must be guided by three key things that are really the crux of this talk today. Accurate information about climate, a race, class, gender, justice lens, and the capacity for human resilience. So I'm going to I'm going to give the what does it say? I'm going to bury the lead or something like that. I'll give you if you want to leave now you can't cuz that's the three things we're talking about. Is really what's the what's the accurate story about climate change? What's really going on here? And what is the connection between race, class, gender oppression to that situation and how does race, class, gender social justice help us figure out how to get out of it? And how do anchors of personal and community resilience help us be able to do that. Because it seems like if you know the information, then we should just automatically respond. What tends to get in the way is privilege and comfort and power and access to the way things are. Like I just, I love my Porsche Cayenne. I don't want to give that up. You know, I don't have a Porsche Cayenne, but let's pretend I did. I would love it so much. I wouldn't want to give it up. And so the access to the privilege and the mindset of classism and racism and sexism and gender oppression, that trips us up every time. That was ableist. It gets in the way every time of being able to respond to the realities of climate change. And what, what gets in the way of us being able to give that up as a macro society? The privilege and the power and the, the resources that we have to make a change that's necessary is resilience. And the pain and the fear and the angst and the, and the inability to respond in the ways that we would like to because we live in this very particular historic moment in this particular society that does not encourage resilience. It doesn't say, really get in touch with what's going on. It says, if you're scared, shop. If you're stressed out, watch TV. If you feel sad, go escape in some way, shape, or form. But whatever you do, don't find resources that will give you deep, profound, emotional, spiritual, moral, or psychosocial resilience. Don't do that. Because there's a whole market built around your pain. And so the market built around our pain is not going to give us the experiences that we need to be able to say, as a white person, I have extraordinary privilege, and I will not be able to participate in climate justice until I dismantle and deconstruct that privilege all the way. And so with resilience, I can have the courage to do that, and then I can enter this climate justice conversation, this sustainability conversation, not only with integrity, but with something to offer. I actually have a different idea to offer. 
So that's really where we're going to today in this brief period of time. So we, like I said, we'll see. I want to just front load the whole situation just in case we don't get to the end. You're like, oh, that would have ended well. You know, so you kind of have an idea of what the outline was. And so I'm, I want to begin with the conversation around anchors. Anchors. And that's what I'm, I'm calling them. Tap roots. Anything that grounds you in. Or whatever the thing is that in the hardest moments you bend but you don't break with the fear. You bend, but you don't break with the stress. Whatever that is, that's what we need. So I'll get back to this later when we talk about resilience, but I want to front it now because it will help us in this conversation. Because this is an incredibly difficult conversation. We need some anchors in this. We need some anchors with this. And so what I'm going to ask you to do is, in whatever configuration you're in, if you're sitting, then put your feet flat on the floor if you're able to do that. If you're standing, you don't have to sit down. Just kind of pause in your stance and ground into your feet. So if you're sitting or standing, whatever you got going on, it's no big deal. And so either uh, feet flat, either sitting or standing, close your eyes, sit as upright or stand as upright as you're able to do to maximize the internal surface area of your lungs. You get maximal uh, oxygen exchange, those little alveoli in there. And so feet flat, sitting upright, eyes closed. I'm just going to ask you to breathe deeply for just a minute, literally just 60 seconds. And as you do, focus only on the physical sensation of air flowing in and out of your nose. If your mind wanders, notice that. Don't judge it. Don't get all judgy. Notice it and come right back. The goal is 60 seconds of laser-like concentration on just the physical sensation of air coming in and out of your nose. Stay in that space. Just keep breathing. You don't have to focus on the in and out anymore, the physical sensation. But stay sitting or standing individually. But we want them in our communities as well. And so what that means is we want interconnection. We really need to anchor into that sense of interconnection. And I try to do it. I try to practice that when I drive. <laughs> it's awesome, right? Because it's like, me, come on. I'm like, kick it. Hi, friend. <laughs> oh, wow. And so anchoring into the reality that we are profoundly interconnected to each other as a species, to this larger biosphere, to the cryosphere, to, to who we are, and to life on this planet and in this community and on this campus. Another typical community anchor in the conversation around climate justice is the sense of collaboration. And we experience that a lot in Minnesota around the seasons, because you just can't make it in a winter in Minnesota all by yourself. It's a really tough thing to do. So you just got to help each other out all the time, all the time. And then interdependence and recognizing that interdependency is that I was joking with someone before the workshop is that that's kind of our natural state is I didn't at some point just that by myself pull down a woolly mammoth and like that. You know, I needed some collaboration. I was profoundly interdependent with the people around me. Um, historically as a species and currently in my life today. So the anchors piece is important because we'll keep coming back to it, but it's really one of the essential points of resilience for a conversation about climate justice and uh, through a social justice lens. Okay, so the overview today is there's really four things I want to touch on. One, you know, I, I was saying to someone when I left on Tuesday morning, it was minus 22, I was like, ah, oh, it's brisk. It is so brisk. And so, <laughs> oh my God. Oh yeah. And so that's not what we're talking about. Four to five degrees, usually five ish is the most common mentioned in the literature. That separates this current climate from an ice age. It's about five degrees that separates these major climactic 
uh, experiences of the Holocene, which is what we're in now, to um, an ice age. But I talk about it as a fever, and this might be a way to share some information when you're sitting having chit-chats with friends, is to say that four to five degrees of air temp doesn't seem like much, but if my body is four degrees warmer, I'm quite ill. I'm 102.6 degrees, and I'm not feeling well. So that four to five degrees is as if the planet is sick. The planet has a fever. The planet is in <coughs> a serious situation in terms of its health. So we need to understand this system. It's complex. You don't have to know every part of it. Just know it's complex, it's vast, but it has some delicate aspects to it. Touching on climate history, and really there's just a couple key things that we'll talk about, this long history, um, and the history of the fact that the, the climate has changed throughout the last 800,000 years that we have data for. We do know that, and even prior to that, we know that. And then a few pieces of data and some commentary about the future, and that will be sufficient to help people understand this basic science. If we can't get some basic science literacy across this society, it will be very difficult for us to understand why we need to act. So quickly, you don't understand any of this. Just your, I said this last night. Your reaction as you see this slide, the slide should be, whoa, that's a lot of crap. Good answer, good answer. Like, all you need to know is like, that's a busy system. That's point one. It is a very busy system with incredible amounts of feedbacks and influences, human influences, just an extraordinary amount of variables in this system. So all you need to know is like, this is an intensely complicated system. And one of the elements of this system is what's called energy balance. And basically what that means is the heat coming in needs to balance with the infrared and other uh, radiation going out. And so we need some balance. The atmosphere is like a, cool, a nice blanket, and it traps the heat in there, and it makes us feel all oh, just fuzzy, like, oh, thank goodness there's that on there. But if we don't have energy balance, if we throw too much CO2 into the atmosphere, it's like adding another blanket on, adding another blanket on, adding another blanket on. We get very hot. We get very hot and we get that fever. So it's a complicated system. There's a balance to the energy, to the heat, to the radiation coming in and out, and we're out of balance. That's all you need to know. How do we know that this CO2 situation is a bad idea? Because down here you have 800,000 years of ice core, uh, sediment data, etc. This is temperature, that's CO2. All you should take from this, from this slide is, hmm, that looks like that fits together. Good answer, good answer, because that's right, that's right. You can see that the record of temperature over these 800,000 years and the record of CO2 over these 800,000 years, you should notice that those lines <laughs> roughly match. So what do we have? We have a complicated system. Wow, there's a lot going on. We have this thing called en energy balance, and we are currently out of balance. Not enough is getting out, so we're warming up. And then we're warming up because of CO2, which we'll get to in a second. And why is that a problem? Why do we know that's a problem? Because we have a long history of the relationship between CO2 and temperature. Sometimes temp drove CO2, sometimes CO2 drove temp, but they have an intimate relationship. And so what's our current story? Our current story is the Keeling curve. Um, and over the last 65 years, there are 55 years here, but it's, I think he started this study in 1958. And so we can see that the mean <coughs> rise in CO2 doesn't look good. So CO2 level is going up. That means more energy and heat is being trapped. It's not being radiated back out. So we are going to warm up. We're going to warm up. And so the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says, all right, so we see this going on. We see this going on. So what does this mean exactly? What does this mean? Well, if we keep business as usual, it will look bad. If we actually stay on the trajectory where we increase our CO2 production into the atmosphere, we could increase our temperature by almost six degrees. If we do very little to mitigate, we could increase our temperature by three degrees. So there are some forecasts using climate models saying, if we do a lot of mitigation, then we might be able to curb this. Some, not so much, none. And so they give us a range of options, not because scientists aren't good at what they do. They give us a range because of the human variability. It's not what the climate will do. It's what we will do. Will we curb CO2 production or not? 
And so the range is dependent upon us. This is in our hands, actually. It is in our hands. The range depends on what we do, what we do. And so you can't read this size point one font up here. The reason I use this is because they talk about impacts, not just in terms of things will get warmer, but they look at hydrology. They look at the ecosystems. They look at food production and food distribution and food availability. They look at coastal situations and sea level rise and transportation related to coasts and, and how the uh, Greenland Glacier, for example, how the melting of that glacier is affecting sea level rise. And they look at public health. They look at global health. When you increase the heat or increase uh, the temperature on different parts of the planet, if the temperature zone, for example, starts to migrate northward, uh, mosquitoes that carry certain disease vectors will follow that migration. And so you're going to see things like dengue fever in places where they've never had dengue fever. Why is that? Because the mosquitoes are like, check this out. I can actually live up here. And, you know, and then you're sick. And then you're sick. And so the impacts are not just <coughs> weather-related impacts. The impacts are on every aspect of our human society. And so again, <coughs> what we need to know, this system is complicated. There's a, so much going on here. And the key element for us around climate dis disruption is this energy balance. Not enough is being radiated back out. We are warming up. Why is that? We suspect it's because of CO2. We see this relationship between CO2 and temperature for 800,000 years. We see a clearly recorded rise in CO2. We see a range of possibilities depending on what we do. And we see all of the potential impacts to humanity. And they are vast. And these are just five key areas that the IPCC identifies. The impacts are vast. This is a shot of the tar sands up in Canada. Can't quite tell because it's a bit fuzzy, but this is the shot of the before and after of the tar sands. What tar sands says, they just rip the skin off the earth, basically. Just rip the skin off. And then they just squeeze, squeeze, squeeze whatever oil they can find. And that's an incredibly dangerous and dirty way to produce hydrocarbons. So grounding again. Grounding again, if you will. Just a few minutes. Let's, uh, let's turn our attention to the front of the can again. <coughs> so where are we? That's just kind of a basic sense of, or a general overview. Where we're at is if you look at this, let me tell you what's on this slide, is that one of the highest peaks over the last 800,000 years of CO2 levels was just below the 300 mark. And where we are right now is right underneath 400. So, so the climate, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere right now is right underneath 400 parts per million. It's rising two parts per million every year. The Arctic ice sheet has been reduced by more than half. Greenland, uh, one of the major ice sheets in Greenland is pouring three times as much water as is in the Chesapeake Bay into the ocean every year. And 2012 was the biggest single year of melt ever recorded, and they used the GRACE satellite to record Greenland melt. It was ever recorded in the Greenland ice sheet. Oceans are roughly 30% more acidic than they were 30 years ago. Atmosphere is roughly 5% wetter than it was 40 years ago. Fundamentally, the energy balance is off. And so what we're trying to do is hopefully say, some people suggest that if we stay below 2 degrees Celsius, we might be able to maintain basic <coughs> climatic factors that we're used to, but we are rapidly shooting past that 2 degree level. And if you look at this potential range of do just a little to do nothing, we are actually going to miss that 2 degree level. We're going to miss that 2 degree level. So this is depressing information. A couple numbers that come from a movie I showed with the faculty workshop is that um, in 2012, it was estimated that our atmosphere, with this two degree kind of ceiling, let's shoot for two degrees, if we can keep it below two degrees, how much CO2 can we still put into the atmosphere? And the number in 2012 was 565 gigatons, roughly. Which sounds like, oh, it's a pile of, pile of gigatons. We can do this. Except for the fact that the oil industry, at the at last recounting last year, 2012 from the video, has 2,795 gig, gigatons of fuels in its reserves. So we can only put 565 up there and hope 
and that's not a good shot, of staying below two degrees. But the oil industry, the coal industry, the fossil fuel industry as a whole has almost 2,800 gigatons. And their stock prices are based not on what's in the Exxon gas tank. Their stock prices are based on what they have in their reserve. So that means in their minds, they have already spent that oil. They've already sold that gas. They've already sold that coal because it's part of their stock portfolio. And so the problem is that we pour roughly 30 billion tons of CO2 a year into our atmosphere, and that number goes up by 3% a year in the business-as-usual pattern. And so in roughly 15 years, we will have hit or surpassed this limit. So the World Bank report in November of 12, the International Energy Agency in 2012, PricewaterhouseCooper, I love Naomi Klein's, a comment about this, not a hippie operation, all in 2012 said that if we dig up those reserves, if we use those reserves, we're in big trouble. And so what does this mean? This means that as the impacts increase, we look at mass species extinction on the four to five degree range. We look at massive flooding, massive drought, massive food shortage. A documentary called Climate Refugees talks about hundreds upon hundreds of millions of climate refugees moving around the planet because they don't have food, they don't have water, they don't have the resources necessary for life. And so the border between India and Pakistan will seem completely irrelevant if India realizes that it needs that water because the heads for the Pakistani rivers are in India and they decide to reroute that. And Pakistan has a few options available to it, as does India. As does this, all of a sudden, this thing is spiraling out of control, right? It's, it's like, what, what, what's happening here? And so the impacts of this are substantial and grave. It's not just, wow, that looks bad. It's like, wow, this is going to affect all of us. We are in this biosphere together. There's no way out. There's no other planet. This isn't, this isn't Avatar. Like, I don't know where we're going to go. There's nowhere else to go. There's nowhere else to go. And so what happens in these moments is overwhelm, and people just kick into denial and fear. They're like, okay, and off they go, off they go. And there's four, four primary reasons, or factors, if you will, contributing to this denial. One is scientific obfuscation, and that's fueled by the carbon industry. And I'll show you a couple of resources that you can pull on for that. The second one is political intractability. That's funded by the carbon industry. And so they bought a lot of they bought a lot of our politicians. So we need to either say you denounce or give back that money, or we will vote someone else in. That's as simple as it goes. We will organize, we will mobilize, and we will put climate-minded people sorry in office in order to move us politically in the direction that we need to go. A third denial in fear is that everyday USers really want things to stay the same. And notice the particular class framing of that. Everyday USers really want things to stay the same. Because people who are marginalized by class, people who experience environmental racism on a regular basis, people who are experiencing the intensity of sexism and gender oppression as it relates to access to resources, they are not saying, yeah, let's keep business as usual. But it's the white, middle class, professional middle class people who have their own homes and their own vehicles and who go on a vacation. These are the people who want things to stay the same. We want business as usual because it's remarkably comfortable. But more importantly than that, we have invested every bit of the solution to our angst into these things. Into these things. It's an intense, intense situation that we're in. And so everyday USers just, how can we fix this and not change anything in my life is what often is said. How can we do that? And then a fourth source of denial is what we call personal belief. So let me just kind of zip through these. Because we're the second major piece of my talk tonight is looking at denial and fear. And so the scientific obfuscation here is what they did with climate change. They did the exact same thing they did with um, cigarettes. Because they didn't have to disprove the science. They just had to create doubt. And there's a great eight-minute video or five-minute video on the Climate Reality Project's website called Doubt. And they show you that they actually used the same PR firm, Washington-based PR firm, to make people think maybe cigarettes aren't so bad. Maybe, because the Surgeon General came out in the 60s and said, yo, this is going to kill you. Like, you need to stop.
stop doing yeah. it. <laughs> Dead. And all they did, they didn't argue with the science. They just had to have people say, maybe that's not true. And so they run these ads. What cigarette does your doctor smoke? Camel. You know, and you're like, oh, a doctor smokes camel. It must be all right. You know, like they confuse people. So doubt or this idea of let's hear both sides or balanced reporting. You know, it's not balanced reporting. There aren't two sides of this. This is not like, is it happening or isn't it happening? That's comparable to, is the world flat or is the world not flat? Like, that's not a conversation we bother having. It's like, wow, huh. Um, overwhelmingly, the majority of climate scientists are exceedingly clear that this is happening. So if I'm sick, I go to 100 doctors, 98 of them say it's liver cancer, two say it's just indigestion, don't worry about it. Am I really going to say, I want some balanced reporting in this situation? No, I'm going to be like, yeah, the 98, let's go with the 98. So what they do is they try to discredit these climate scientists by saying, oh, they're just in it for the research money, or they have a financial incentive. This is one of the key claims of climate deniers, and yet the top five oil companies, this is data from 2012 from that video, top five oil companies in 2012 made $137 billion. They made $375 million a day. The CEO of Exxon made $100,000 a day. Exxon spends $100 million a day for the exploration of new hydrocarbons. They are given $6.6 .6 million of tax breaks every day. They spend $440,000 a day lobbying Congress. So if we're going to use financial incentives as the basis of discrediting, then we should discredit the carbon industry's framing of it's not a problem. I, I said this the other, I hope I'm not, well, I, I, I leave tomorrow, so whatever. So I was watching <laughs> television, and I'm seeing this ad for safe, clean fracking. And I'm like, yeah. who here is believing this? Like, what? And I saw it again this morning. I was like, oh, I'm on to you. I'm on to you. You know, I know you're lying. I know you're lying. It's good for our water. It's good. Like, just get the DVD gas land, right? I think you can get it from Amazon or something for $12. Just buy that and show it. Just happen to stick it in the DVD player in the residence hall. So I don't know how I got there. And then make everybody watch it. You're like, oh. And so the scientific confusion is one of the roots of denial. The second one is political intractability because of campaign finance, because of gross scientific illiteracy in our US Congress. I mean, borderline, borderline malpractice, if you will, for their job. I mean, it's such incredible scientific illiteracy. And this global sense of who's going to blink first. Are we going to blink first, or is China going to blink first? Is Brazil going to blink first? Is India going to blink first? Is Russia, the BRIC countries, are the BRICs going to blink first, or are the US, the UK, and the EU? The third piece, everyday USers, is about resources, lifestyles, and worldview. They don't, don't want that to change. That is deeply rooted in race, class, and gender access. So the systems of power and privilege that afford dominant group members in these three forms of oppression have given this sense of safety and comfort that even the reality of climate change can't seem to penetrate. And so we must do it through a social justice lens. If climate change is not enough to dislodge race, class, gender, privilege, then we must use the tools of race, class, gender, liberation to dislodge those forms of oppression, open people's minds, and let them grasp the reality of what's going on. The fourth denial and fear are personal beliefs. And this is a great study. I'm sure you've probably been exposed to it. But Yale, um, Yale uh, published in 2011 Global Warming in the Six Americas, and that was part of their project, Climate Change Communication. The first piece was in 2011. They updated it in March of 2012. And basically what they showed is that the people who tend to believe in climate change, that it's happening, we should do something about it, have a particular set of political beliefs and ideologies. And as you move farther across the scale to climate denial, you see a different range of political ideologies. And you also see some religious affiliations as well that say it's not bad. It's not bad. It's foretold that this is going to happen, and so it's okay. It's okay. And so it's useful to read that report just to get a sense of what the spectrum is of people who are denying or not. But given these two main pathways, this is one way we can talk about uh, denial, is that given the pathway of it's not happening, or you're making too much of it, or it is happening and we should do something now, here's a way 
to address that as we try to lean into that in our classes, lean into that with our peers, lean into that with family and friends and partners and residence halls, wherever you are, you can say, okay, okay, so data this way, data that way, you've got your study that you read somewhere, da 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 da, da. we've got two things. It's not happening, don't do anything, it is happening, do something. The way to kind of gauge what we should do given that kind of impasse is, what if you're wrong? What if you're wrong? So we move to a carbon neutral economy. It's not that we don't have vehicles, they're just all electric. So we retool Detroit, we figure out different ways to give transportation, everybody gets around, people have jobs. We move from a carbon energy industry, hydrocarbon energy industry to um, a renewable energy industry. We retool US industrialization to close loop production. We try hard to protect jobs, to retrain people, da 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 da, -da and we prepare. Let's pretend it's all wrong. That's not a bad society to live in. But if these people are wrong, we ha we're cooked. We are literally cooked. So if you're going to hit the impasse of you said, you said, data, data, let's just move to a different place and say, let's play a little roulette here. What if you're wrong? What would happen if you're wrong? And if we do this work well, and this side is wrong, and I'm definitely on this side, then that's not a bad world to live in. If we do this, hundreds and hundreds of millions of people will die. And that's not hyperbole. That's just the reality of how many hundreds of millions of people live on coastlines around the world. That's just the truth of it. And so one of the ways that we can turn this on its head is say, skip the data. What if you're wrong? And what if I'm wrong? Let's just look at what that would look like and play that scenario out. The last bit around this, and this will lead us into race, class, gender, is this notion of what's really going on, what's scratching underneath the surface. Why, I mean, at some point I was like, I'm so frustrated. <laughs> you know, so I started having workshops in my house. I just bought a bunch of books and I gave them out for free. I first invited people over not telling them they were coming to a climate change workshop. I invited them for brunch. They did not appreciate that. They're like, wait a minute, we're here for social hour. I'm like, no, no, you're not. And so then they were like, wow, I got to pick up the kids. I was like, you don't have kids. Somebody's kids need to be picked up and I have to leave. So that was tough. So then I said, okay, okay, come over for this thing. And I will feed you still and da, 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 da. And as I pressed and pushed and prodded, what really, what it came down to is I have built my whole worldview around these things. I've built my whole life on this notion that if I work hard, I will advance economically. I've built my whole worldview on this idea of this particular economic structure. And if I just try harder, I can get to the top because there is a top. I've built my whole worldview on my life surrounded by nothing but white people. And then they say, to be honest with you, as a white person, people of color and native people scare me because I don't know enough. I have been miseducated racially. I do not have a critical race lens. I don't know what to do about it. And then they go on. They talk about you know, the gendered realities of dominance and of mastering nature and just technocrating our way out of it. I'm sure we can just find a machine that will do it. And so we scratch and we scratch and we scratch and what's underneath the denial of good-hearted people is this notion of Galileo, right? You are disrupting my entire worldview and I will put you to death. So what that means is I will walk away from the conversation. I will tell you that you're wrong. I will pr try to prove all the reasons that it could be different. I mean, I'll throw everything I have, including the kitchen sink, because what you're telling me is that life as I have understood it and the future I have banked on is not going to be the future I've banked on. And particularly for people who have young people in their lives, they're like, you are telling me that my child will not live the, in the world that I lived in. How dare you do that? It's like, I know, sister. I know, I get that. And, and, what if you're wrong? What happens to her then, her child? What if you're wrong? So, this is really what's going on, is that for everyday USers who just want their lives to stay the same, you know, they just, or political intractability in the power and the ways government has worked and their sense of what it, all of this stuff, it really comes down to this chipping away at worldview for USers. I was doing a workshop and there was a dude from France and in it just a couple weeks ago, he's like, 
why are you still debating this? I'm like, I don't know, man. I mean, it's, uh, it's complicated. We're complicated people. Yeah. And he's like, you're, and he had other words for us. You know what I mean? So, uh, I'm, like, I'm not going to disagree with that. So, so the point was, is that there's so much about being a USer, a mainstream, multi-generational white USer, that this particular worldview I have, that is just devastating to the rest of the world. It's devastating to poor working class people, people of color, native people, and women, and, uh, cisgendered women and trans people in this society. But it's devastating for the world. It's devastating for the world. Okay, so just a t quick two minute check in again with your, your, so a couple minutes each, check in, thoughts, reactions, thoughts, reactions. So it begs the question, how did we get here? Like this is a messed up situation. How did we get here? How did we get here? And it's easy to kind of say, you know, it just happened. It's like a garden gnome. This, there it is. You know, like, whoa, how did we get here? That's actually not true. That's actually not true. And so my framing of this as the entree into the relationship of race, class, gender to this conversation, I'm just going to stand on this chair first. I don't know why. It just feels like I can do this thing. So, so the framing is if we begin with European city states, European city states, and so they're competing against each other. And you've got, I mean, Italy isn't even a country. You've got Venice, and then you've got uh, uh, other European city states. You've got Madrid, and you've got London, and da 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 da. You've got all these city states competing against each other. And in their framework, stuff is power. They're like, get more stuff! Oi, let's give more stuff. You know, off we go, give more stuff. Da, 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 da. And so they have this imperialist mindset. And you might say, well, that's just human nature. Absolutely not. Absolutely not for two reasons. One is we're wired to connect, actually. We're not wired, we're not wired for xenophobia. We're wired to connect. And it's a different workshop that I do with a colleague about looking at trauma and looking at the stages of alert, <coughs> then flight, fight, freeze, and fold. And so at alert, when you see someone or something that's different, if, uh, if you're a balance, if your parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system is in balance, you will have an alert and then you'll recognize that it's not a threat and you'll be cool. But when your nervous system's all jacked from you know, a lifetime or many lifetimes through transgenerational epigenetic inheritance, many lifetimes of trauma, you are going to see alert and immediately go to flight, fight, or freeze, fold. And so you'll attack. So I'm not romanticizing indigenous communities here, but what we know from testimonials, testimonials of in the moment of what happened, is that many native nations, upon their first encounter with Europeans, had the alert and was like, oh, well, maybe you're, I'm curious about you. The first response with a balanced nervous system is alert and then curiosity. Oh, that's fascinating. And you can see it in Columbus's own journal, because he said exactly that. When you read Howard's Ends of People's History of the United States, it's on the very first page, page one of that book. He said, you know, the natives, da, 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 they came out, they greeted us, they were curious about us. And then at the end of that passage from his journal, he said, with 50 men, we can enslave this entire island. This is going to be great for us, right? Because he comes from a city-state system that is violent and repressive. He comes from a continent with centuries of violence and oppression. And, and so his alert kicks into just this constant framing of flight, fight, freeze, fold. And that is inherent, that nervous system response. And you can read the work of uh, Bessel van der Kolk or Peter Levine in terms of understanding trauma. That's inherent in imperialism. But it's not inherent to the human condition. It's not. It's not. So this imperialist mindset where stuff, get more stuff, stuff equals power, led to colonization. And colonization led to the unbelievable acquisition, exploitation, extraction of resources and genocide of millions upon millions upon tens of millions of people. Right? And then in this mindset, after it has churned for a few centuries, you drop in industrialization. So the mindset at this time is acquisition of stuff will give me power and get it at all. It moves into a race lens as well. So it's class, 
gender and race oppression is the mindset that's utilizing industrialization for mass production, mass expansion, and as you produce more stuff, you need more resources. You need more resources, so you continue to colonize. You continue to colonize, and as you produce more stuff with those resources, you need people to buy it. So you start to inculcate this ideology of consumerism, where in the United States, we are so deeply identified with our stuff. Sometimes I call it an odiology, because it's an odious ideology. Yeah. It's an odiology of consumerism, this kind of sense of, I'm not okay. And, th and this is where Annie Leonard's story of stuff, this is it right here. This is what we were talking about, is that you work all day so you can get some stuff, and then you go home, TV tells you your stuff is crap, so go get more stuff, but you got to work harder to go get more stuff, and then you get it, and you're like, I love my stuff. And then you realize, oh, I've got the wrong stuff. You know, so you go back to work, and then da, 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 on and on and on. And consumerism in this country has been raised to a professional level, a professional level. First statements after September 11th, I don't think it was 48 hours, and the message from the leader of this country was shock. Not take hot dish, which I still don't know exactly what that is, but don't take hot dish to your neighbor. It has tater tots, like that's one of the key ingredients, but everybody's got a different recipe. So it's not hot dish to your neighbor, it's go shop or travel, because we're really worried about the travel industry. And then we take this ideology of consumerism and we globalize it. And so what was fascinating about U.S. imperialism is we didn't at some point have to send troops anymore. We just sent Levi's televisions and satellite dishes. And we got people hooked. We got people hooked. And so when we see how did we get here, how did we get so distracted that we couldn't tell what was happening to our home? How did we get so separated from the natural world that we missed what was going on? What on earth has happened? How did this happen? And it happens through this construction of a class oppression lens, racial oppression lens, and gender oppression. And I've just parenthetically put just some keywords in case I say too much. You can just kind of hang your hat on these keywords. The class oppression lens is about resources. It's about endless consumption and acquisition of resources. And it's about endless profit, endless profit. And I just still think it's so fascinating that the primary culprits of 2008, I think only two have been brought up on charges, and I don't think anyone's gone to jail. But I certainly see a lot of sheriffs, uh, you know, people in the sheriff's department serving eviction notices to people in my neighborhood. So I certainly see the wheels of government kicking the most vulnerable people out of their homes. But I don't see anybody who brought the house down getting held accountable or brought to task for what they did, what they did. And that's because in a highly classist society like ours, where you have an astonishing gap between the haves and the haves not, the system is theirs until we take it back. Literally until we take it back. And so we also couple that in this society with racial oppression. And deeply embedded in racial oppression is the idea of supremacy. I often, when I do the race, racism, and whiteness bits, I'll have people say, some white, a white person will say, racism has been around forever. You know, I'm like, that's so awesome. First, because you can take, you can take the professor out of the classroom, but not the classroom out of the professor. So my first response is, well, what's your reference for forever? I mean, that's a big one. You mean, I need a lot of references for forever. I mean, time, scale, da da da. You know, I'm like, reference that, please. But the second piece is, no, sweetheart, you're just so wrong. You're just so wrong. What you're thinking about has been around forever, quote unquote, and that's marginal, of course is the presence of melanin, you know, the differentiation of skin color. As is appropriate with a global dispersion of our species, it makes perfect sense at different latitudes, you're going to have different degrees of melanin to serve different biological functions. So that's melanin. That's been around for quite a while. But race is four centuries old. It got cooked up in North America. It got cooked up because the British came over, colonized, tried European indentured servitude, worked them, la, la, la. They're like, we hate you so much, you're working us too hard. Sure, what are you going to do, go home? You know, like, blah, 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 blah. So they didn't leave, but they wrote home and said, oi, don't come. Don't come over here. You know, and so European indentured servitude trickled. So then they said, well, let's try to enslave indigenous communities. 
for multi multiple reasons. That was an impossible task at that current colonial moment. So then they left south, saw the Atlantic slave trade, said, yeah, let's get on out of that. So they engaged in this, and what they noticed is that their horrible treatment of these three groups of people was leading to this populist moment where these three groups were going to get together and overthrow them. So they said, oi, are, are the normal ways we organize power aren't working. What can we do? And they create race. So Jamestown, 1619, 20 people of African descent arrive. They're not in the institution of slavery yet, but they're not indentured servants. They're somewhere in the middle. But it didn't take more than 20 to 30 years, perhaps, right around 1640, where you start to see black for the first time. 1700, you see white for the first time in Virginia and Maryland documents. They made it up. Made it up. You're not going to see reference to whiteness in Europe prior to European colonization in North America. You'll see Germanness, some intense like, Mama! but you're not going to see like, oh yes, we as white people are gathering around and doing our white junk. You know, like I love eating white food and doing white dances, and I, I mean, you're just not going to see it. You're not going to see. It. So the social construction of race, what's embedded in it is inferiority. What's embedded in it is target group and then groups that can be brutalized and utilized and you know. Uh, uh, um, extorted and marginalized in this society. But you have to have the counterbalance to that. So you have to have supremacy. So you start to cook up this story about the supremacy of whiteness. Whiteness is superior. Whiteness is ideal female beauty. Whiteness is culture and civilized. Whiteness is the new world. Whiteness is the age of enlightenment. And then you start to see kind of uh, historians kind of retroactively rewriting, revisionist historians rewriting history as if this whiteness has always existed, as if it's always been true. And so this supremacy plays out in really profound ways around climate change, around the ways that we have responded to climate, the ways we've utilized resources, and the ways we have seen ourselves in this society. And then the third one is gender oppression. And the, the primary marker I hold out for that is just this notion of dominating nature. Dominating nature. There's going to be this sense of um, codified gender, uh, gender uh, stratification in different historic moments throughout human history, but not consistently. Not consistently, but you can see pockets of this codification. And then as Europe becomes Europe in a way, you start to see this get codified more and more. You attach that to the age of enlightenment and to dominance thinking, to controlled thinking. I think, therefore, I am. And then you make nature the feminine. What ends up happening is this notion in a sexist space is the inevitable, inevitable notion that we can dominate and control nature. Match that with older forms of Christian hegemony, and now you've really got a potent mix of dominating nature, controlling nature. We don't live in chorus with nature. We are here to dominate it. We are the superior species. We will dominate this planet. And the mindsets, those three mindsets, are incredibly dangerous when coupled with hydrocarbons. <laughs> when you couple that with hydrocarbons, you've got a bad mix. You've got a bad mix. So very quickly, check in with your neighbor to make sure you've got what I've said so far. Any questions or comments or thoughts, and then we'll come back.